Um, so now let me introduce our keynote speaker. Um, today we have Kevin Henney. Um, he's an independent consultant, speaker, trainer, writer. Um, he has published many things in different magazines, websites. He co-edited the 90 things every software developer should know. And if you don't know, you should know. Um, and actually, I've been um, kind of going back into his blog. And just recently in his blog, he, he has a post around the bubble sort with Hungarian folk dance by Algorithmics. Oh my God, that was amazing. Thank you for posting that. I, I haven't run into that yet. Now I got a bookmark. I got to go for it. Um, but from Bubble Sword, he's going to be talking about to us today about refactoring, right? So going beyond the tools to help us find the real interesting parts of refactoring. So Kevin, um, please join join the stage. Right. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Pretty good. How are you? Very good. The sun is shining, um, and I have a talk, so this is great. All right, then let's kick it off. Go for it. Okay. Right. Excellent. Right. So, good afternoon, crafters. Um, so, let's start off with a picture of Stonehenge. Um, very old, um, classic monolithic architecture. Uh, what am I going to talk about? What I'm going to talk about is the idea that refactoring is not just clickbait. Uh, what I mean by that specifically is that we have become used to an idea of refactoring, but we perhaps missed some of the deeper ideas um, that are uh, at play. So I want to revisit what those are to understand some of our motivation for refactoring, but also some of the mechanics and where we want to take our refactorings. So um, a fairly classic legacy system. Uh, we're not entirely sure why it was built. Um, very difficult to change, um, filled with monoliths from the Greek monolithos. I'm not referring to the newer definition that people in the microservices space use. They, they use microservice to mean, uh, sorry, my, monolith to mean an applica a single process application, whereas historically monolith has not referred to um, your process architecture, it's referred to your code architecture. Um, many people are reinventing monolithic code in uh, microservices. Um, uh, monolith as in something that is hard to move, hard to change. But it is an early example of architecture and a very good example of a legacy system. But I'm talking architecture here. When we talk about architecture, we tend to think of something um, more designed, more intentional. Uh, and this uh, um, observation uh, from Konstantin Bracuzzi, uh, architecture is inhabited sculpture, is uh, something we should always remember from a software development point of view. Architecture is not simply the way that it runs for somebody else. As developers, we live inside the code. Um, and we, we're inside it and it has some uh, qualities to it that make it more or less livable, more or less habitable. Now, the problem is that as time goes by, we often find that um, our assumptions change. That leaves us with um, uh, problems. It leaves us with unmanaged technical debt. If we're managing our technical debt, that's great. But if we're not managing it, then that's a problem. Um, uh, it leaves us with a weight that holds us back. It is, becomes a big stone that holds us back. But within every legacy system, and by the way, how long does it take to create a legacy system? Based on the workshops that I run, um, to create legacy code takes about five minutes. Some people think it takes five years. Uh, it takes about five minutes. You can see people creating code in a way that is going to be not simply... Um, not necessarily the best solution. We, we are always in a constant state of learning. Um, so never tell yourself off for not coming up with the best solution. The challenge is, can we make our solutions um, uh, converge on being better over time, but also to track the changes in assumptions? Sometimes people think of bad architecture as just bad decisions that were made in the past, but that's not the case. Likewise, when we think about legacy code, it's not that the code was necessarily bad in the past, but it has become um, a bad match for what it is supposed to do over time. Time is the issue. But even within these things, we can observe that there is a process for discovering and recovering. There's a beautiful angel in that block of marble and I am going to find it. All I have to do is to knock off the outside pieces of marble and be very careful not to cut into the angel with my chisel. 
Sometimes this has been attributed to um, Michelangelo uh, and other historical figures. It's actually much more recent, um, uh, George Pentecost. But what we're talking about here in some senses follows this idea of emergent and um, uh, incremental and iterative design, uh, the heart of which is an idea we refer to as refactoring. Now, definition of refactoring, Martin Fowler gives, a change made to the internal structure of software to make it easier to understand and cheaper to modify without changing its observable behavior. Uh, and this is the definition that he had in um, the first edition of his book, uh, which was uh, 1999. Um, and the second edition was 2019. Guess what? Same definition. The idea of refactoring, though, um, goes back a little bit further. The idea of refactoring um, is really uh, it dates to the kind of late 80s, early 90s, and um, uh, the work of Bill Opdyke. Um, uh, Ralph Johnson, uh, um, uh, which some of you, uh, who some of you may recognize as uh, one of the gang of four design patterns guys. Um, he was uh, the supervisor, a lot of, um, and this is at uh, the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, which is uh, heart to a lot of good stuff in the patent space, but also in the refactoring space, um, and particularly automated refactorings. And uh, Bill Opdyke um, uh, highlights the um, uh, uh, this definition, the refactorings are defined to be behavior preserving. Now, let's try and understand what we mean when we talk about behavior, because um, actually specifically, it's not, not all the behavior is necessarily preserved. Um, so to understand that, we need to have a better framework for thinking about the properties and qualities of our code. And Sometimes people talk about functional properties versus non-functional properties of code. That's not really very helpful, is it? Um, it's not a very uh, not a very meaningful term, non-functional. What does that tell you? It tells you what it isn't. It doesn't tell you what it is. But it also obscures the fact that there are multiple categories, two of which I'm interested in here, um, that uh, are quite different to one another. Um, operational or execution qualities. Okay, versus developmental or development time qualities. The functional properties of a piece of code are the semantics. That's what we're going to preserve. Things like um, memory usage, um, uh, throughput, latency, all of these, these are operational capabilities. And indeed, they are not functional, but that doesn't tell us what they are. They're actually quite different from these other ones, developmental, which is to do with things like habitability of code, technical debt, um, the general qualities we think of as qualities of the code. Those are the ones we, we essentially want to improve. So unless you make a distinct, if you find yourself using the term non-functional, pause, think about it. What is it? Not what, it, what isn't it, what is it? You will find there are more categories, that um, not all of which are created equal. Now, when we fix bugs, Clearly what we're doing when we fix bugs is we are improving the functional um, aspects. Um, we are changing the semantics. We, have the, we don't have the semantics that we want, so we're gonna improve the semantics. When we fix a bug, does the performance get better or does it get worse? Does the developmental quality of the code get better or does it get worse? I know what we hope, but it's not necessary that the quality of the code gets better when a bug is fixed. That's a desire, but it's not a necessity. What about optimization? Optimization has a particularly interesting um, character here. Optimization looks a little bit like this. It preserves the functionality, okay? It preserves the semantics. That's an important feature. It's no good saying, yep, yeah, this code runs 10 times faster, but it's wrong. It's, that's no value. You know? Having your bugs run fast is not what we're really after. So the goal here is to keep the functionality fixed and then change, improve some aspect of the operational behavior. What happens to the developmental quality? Well, maybe it gets better, maybe it gets worse, maybe it stays the same. We tend to think in many cases that um, developmental quality will get worse because many optimizations are to do with special case handling. Um, you know, and we may, for example, to improve some aspects of performance, we may add a cache, right? You've just made the code more complex. That doesn't mean that it's not unreasonable. We, just have to understand code with a cache is always more complex than code without a cache. You know, it's, uh, you know, you just count the number of lines or the logic. It's simple as that. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is a trade-off. But there are also cases where the code actually gets simpler. Um, there is no code faster than no code uh, was one of the observations of the intelligent guide to designing programs. Um, and uh, that's a very helpful one. Uh, removing things sometimes simplifies things and makes them faster. 
And then we reach refactoring, which like optimization is a functionality preserving transformation. The goal here, keep the semantics the same. We're gonna change the code, but what is our specific objective? It is to improve some aspect of the developmental quality, to make it easier to change in future or easier to understand. This is what, this is what refactoring is. What happens to the performance? Maybe it stays the same, maybe it gets better, maybe it gets worse, but that's not our focus or our goal. Now, this is important to clarify because I sometimes, I find people misusing the word. Refactoring has a very specific definition. And I sometimes I've heard people say, oh yeah, you know, what, 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 I'm just gonna refactor the code, what are you doing? You know, uh, what, what's the refactoring? Oh, I'm making, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm making the code faster. Well, that's not a refactoring, that's an optimization. Oh, I'm just refactoring the code, what are you doing? I'm adding functionality. No, that's not refactoring because you're changing the behavior. Um, that's adding functionality. Oh, I'm refactoring the code. What are you doing? I'm fixing a bug. Mm, again, that's not refactoring. Refactoring has a very precise definition. If you're fixing a bug, you're fixing the functionality. You're improving the semantics. You are intentionally changing the semantics. So the term refactor, some people have this idea that refactoring just means change the code. We already have a term for that, it's called change. You know, Change the code means change the code. The subset that we're interested in is the subject where we apply refactoring and do some refactoring. Um, so what does it mean? Again, the definition that um, we're offered is uh, uh, by Martin Fowler, to restructure the software by applying a series of refactorings without changing the observable behavior of the software. So how should we go about doing this? I mean, should we do it all at once? Should we have the system not build um, for a week whilst we fix everything? Should we have a refactoring sprint where nothing works, but at the end we're hoping everything will work because we're doing big changes? Well. Yeah, that's probably more like rewriting or re-engineering. It's not really refactoring. The whole point of refactoring is that it is a more gradual process. And this is the first point. People get wrapped up these days, either that refactoring is a big thing that has to take a whole sprint, or, and hence the title of this talk, it's not just clickbait. They think of refactoring as just, oh, it's a shortcut key. My refactorings are the shortcut keys. That's it. That's what we mean by refactoring. Refactoring is a process. Automating part of that process automates part of that, part of that process, but it is not the process. The automation, you can do refactoring without automated refactorings. In fact, Martin Fowler's books, are, uh, his first edition book was exactly about that. There were not commercially um, widespread available refactoring tools um, for the languages of interest. Refactoring was basically unheard of. Um, so does that mean we couldn't do refactoring? No, you don't need a refactoring tool to do refactoring. That's a myth. What a refactoring tool does is it automates things to make certain things easier. It does not make them possible, it just makes them easier. It makes certain things more accessible. It makes them more reliable, okay? But that's not the only thing. If you want to do refactoring, you also kind of need to do things like testing. Um, you know, it's particularly with uh, dynamic languages or where you are using a static language and going through dynamic layers uh, or other language layers. You need to guarantee the tools do as much as they can to preserve the semantics. But until you've shown that you've preserved the semantics, you haven't shown that you preserve the semantics. But you don't need the automated refactoring to do refactoring, but it's a big difference. But people get locked up in the idea that, oh yeah, my refactorings, that's, see the shortcut menu, that's it. The philosophy of the change, you have to know what you want and then you have to be able to apply it. So the philosophy was actually, we can go back somewhat before 1992, we can go back to the 19th century. Um, this is Isabella Beaton. Uh, she uh, was a writer, um, uh, lived in Victorian England, um, sadly died at the age of 29, um, but achieved an immense amount um, and a long lasting influence. She wrote a book called The Book of Household Man Management. Um, and this was a highly influential book and it's about managing households. Funnily enough, it's also about code. She didn't know it at the time, but it's a metaphor for code. And when she talks about how should we clean our kitchen, how should we attend to our kitchens, her observation was there is no work like early work, okay? You don't leave cleaning till later. You, you know, you, you get in there early. Clear as you go, muddle makes more muddle. This is still guidance that people use in commercial kitchens. You don't create a big pot, you don't create a big mess and then try and clean it. You amortize the cost. You account for the fact that the work that you are doing includes refactoring. There's no, 
this whole thing that people have, I need to go to management to ask permission to refactor. No, you don't. Do you ask management for permission to compile? Do you ask management for permission to open your IDE? Do you ask management for permission to check in? No, of course you don't. It's called software development. You are a software developer. That is your job. And refactoring is not a separate thing. It is part of that. You don't ask people for permission to write a test. You write a test. You don't ask uh, permission to refactor a piece of code when you're working on that very piece of code. Hey, I'm going to add some features. You know, this could do with some refactoring before we add that. No, you're not allowed to refactor. That's ridiculous. The point is, it's part of your work. Clear as you go. And because you don't know the best solution when you first do it, you're going to make some mess. Of course you are. Yeah. So therefore, anticipate the fact that that is part of your work. Do not leave it till later. Now, there is this thing. As Bill Updike, his work, his thesis was to explore um, the, uh, uh, the idea of automated refactorings. He was looking at automated refactorings in C++ in 1992, just to give you a kind of sense of how far we haven't come. It's uh, 30 years later, and really the, C++ is one of the last languages to get decent refactoring tools. Um, uh, the focus of the thesis is on automated, uh, automating the refactorings in a way that preserves the behavior of a program. So a fairly classic one. I'm going to pick on an um, example from 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know that Dan Terhorst North contributed. Code in the language of the domain. It's a very, a very clear one. Um, the idea here is that what is our intent? A refactory is not simply a transformation. It is a transformation done with intent. We can look at this code and we can go, ah, you know what, the names are pretty good but I don't really understand what it's doing. Portfolio IDs by trader ID, get, get trader dot get ID dot contains key. Yeah. I don't really understand the intention here. Some people would add a comment. See, you can not do that, okay? What, what's the intent here? What we're doing is we're looking at the permissions for whether or not traders in an investment bank are able to view particular portfolios. This is to do with governance. We can actually capture that. Trader can view portfolio. Huh. Okay. So this was an extract method. All that logic still exists, but now we have a better name for it. We've abstracted it elsewhere. So we've got an intent, which is, I wish to communicate the intent of the code. What is the purpose of this code? What is it trying to do? Adding a comment doesn't do that. Adding a comment gives um, doesn't help the compiler and it doesn't help the reader. It doesn't transform the code in a meaningful way. I mean, it's, you know, it's a marginal change, but um, it doesn't compile correctly or incorrectly unless you get the comment syntax wrong. Um, it doesn't really change the code. So we want to, the, our goal is to communicate, to make the code more comprehensible, to make it more habitable, to create a better space for ourselves in our architecture. And here we've done that and the, we've applied extract method. Now, the point here is that I think many people were hoping, and I, I know I kind of hoped that, you know, once you've got automated refactorings, then you know what? So I tweeted this last week. One of the great things about languages with modern IDE support is that thanks to refactoring tools, legacy code is a thing of the past. Unlike with older languages, developers never have to experience long methods, rambling classes, poor identifier names, complex logic, and so on. Because, you know, why would you have these things if you've got an automated refactoring? Some people used to say, oh, we, we don't do this because you know, we don't have automated refactorings. You have automated refactorings. Um, what actually triggered this was last week, I saw some uh, C-sharp code and there was a method that was about 1500 lines long. They had refactoring tools. The refactoring tools that come with Visual Studio are perfectly adequate to break up. Um, you don't even need ReSharper. To break up a 1500 line method is easy. Why, why do we let ourselves have this? We have the tools. So there's the interesting thing. We have, if you are dealing with a class that is messy, things that have bad names, methods that are long, why? What, what, how did you get to that point? I'm not telling anybody off here. I just need the people to understand that there is absolutely no technical reason. So it's not technical. The reason that we have legacy code is not a technical reason. And it's also not to do with time because we have automated refactorings. That's the thing that automation gives you. You can do it like that, okay? If you've ever refactored, I've refactored a code base without automated refactoring tools. It was a C code base a number of years ago. And I made a note of the refactorings. I wrote them down and, I, uh, and uh, you know, they took time because I had to be a little more careful. I did also have tests, which, which certainly helped. But the point is we have automated refactorings. You've got a nice set of tests, I hope. But even without the set of tests, the automated refactorings, why, so why is it, you know, 
So I, I kind of posted this just to make sure that people didn't think that I was being completely stupid. And then this, because, you know, come on, we've got to understand that this is not really actually about the tools. Um, people often are not focusing on the knowledge that they have and how to apply them. Most people are never taught refactoring. And this, I have to admit, for me, was a bit of a blind spot. When I started uh, teaching people and helping people with test-driven development, I said, oh, yeah, yeah, don't worry. Yeah, the final step of, uh, of a test for a cycle is normally refactoring. I kind of assumed that people would know what they were doing. It turns out people have not, it's a separate skill. First of all, you have to know what kind of decent code looks like for a particular situation. You have to know how to evaluate code in that context. And that sometimes means experimentation and therefore change. You have to know what kind of refactorings you want. You have to know what good looks like and then how to get there. It turns out that automation is not the problem. We've demonstrated that. Legacy code exists in the era of refactoring and with languages that have grown up with refactoring tools combined. I'm not talking about C and C++ here. I'm not talking about a number of scripting languages. I'm talking about languages like Java for which there is a lot of very questionable legacy code. These are, this is a language that has grown up and helped refactor and grow up. So the problem is clearly not the tools. It's to do with knowledge and intent. So I asked a couple of questions. Um, what family of refactorings do you find you use most, whether automated or not? And what refactorings do you feel are most overlooked or underutilized? So my, I had a couple of predictions. My basic prediction was that probably it's gonna be the extract. People, people are gonna extract things um, most likely extract method. And pretty much in the tweets that people responded with, yep, there was that. The other biggie, rename. Nice one. Yep, I guess that one, that's actually one of the most popular ones, renaming things. Like, yeah, this is good. Okay. Of course, there are limits to what we can rename. Um, uh, and Martin Fowler highlights this idea of, you know, be careful with published interfaces, APIs um, that um, are, that are used by other people, but whose code we do not influence or interact with. So, you know, change your, so don't publish interfaces prematurely and modify your code ownership policies to smooth refactoring. This is important because this goes against um, a kind of a guideline that people try to apply, although they've misunderstood, uh, that it's been commonly misunderstood. The, uh, sometimes people call it the open close principle. Um, there is a thing called the open close principle uh, defined by Bertrand Meyer. Um, that's absolutely unrelated to um, uh, what people think they're talking about when they talk about the open close principle. Although it was inspired by it, uh, it was based on a misunderstanding of it that's been popularized uh, by Robert Martin. Um, but the problem is that misunderstanding doesn't make any sense. Uh, open close principle basically says that your code should be open for extension and close to change. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You want your code to be as open to change as possible. Yeah, um, we favor refactoring. We are living in the 21st century, not the 20th century. Um, you want code that is as open to change as possible. Yeah, you want to avoid publishing interfaces that prevent you from changing. It's not a principle you want to apply. You want as little of your code to follow this idea as possible. Restructure your code ownership. So OCP is kind of an anti-agile principle and not something I'm particularly interested in. Um, uh, although I'm interested in its history and the way that people have misunderstood it and misapplied it consistently. But we can see that there are clearly boundaries. There are things you can't change. So if you're in the Java space, you're very familiar with perhaps the clonable interface. Um, if you're in uh, the .NET space, the iClonable interface, I have some bad news for you. This is not actually the appropriate way to spell clonable. Um, sure, English spelling is a bit of a nightmare. I, you know, it's, it's, it's a complete mess. Sometimes people say, you know, English does not have a logical system of spelling they're wrong. English has about eight or nine or 10 logical systems of spelling. That's the problem. If it only had one, that would be fine, but it has lots and they are on collision. But in as much as there is any logic, this is the correct way to spell it. In fact, we can even see this. If you go to Wiktionary, there it is, clonable without that first E. But what I love about this is it says alternative forms, especially in computing context, because of the misspelling by Sun back in the mid 1990s, that misspelling with the extra E has spread all the way through. And people now, it's so commonly used, people have now changed the spelling. So well done software developers. The point here is public APIs like diamonds are forever. You wanna restrict the publication as much as possible. Narrow it and understand what your policy of evolution and change is. That's not, a, that's not an automation thing. That is actually a deeper design thing. So refactorings are the kind of like the lubrication of change, but they are not the big picture. 
Uh, you need to have intent and purpose. Refactoring is part of a bigger process. We call that process design. But we're not very complete with our ideas of design. So what refactorings do people feel were most overlooked and underutilized? Uh, well, there are a number. I, I, it could be a longer list, but extract class. That's really one of them. So uh, that one I'd originally overlooked because I originally thought, oh, just extract. But actually, no, P extract method is very popular, but extract class is definitely underused when we think about it. And that was an observation that many people highlighted. Inlining things. People also automatically assume that when you have a complex thing, the first thing you should do is pull everything out. Actually, until you understand it, that may not be the right way. You might actually need to flatten things back in so you understand really what's going on to then allow you to re-refactor once you've got a better image of what's going on. Replacing constructs with other constructs that are equivalent is not as widely used as we would hope. This one I had anticipated. I notice it a lot. Um, people leave big switch statements growing and growing and growing, um, whereas they could be introducing things like uh, polymorphism. Uh, but also a couple of people point out deleting. Um, Getting rid of stuff, that's kind of important. Um, uh, because this is about dealing with dead code and code that's not helpful. We keep talking about incremental development, but we don't talk enough about decremental development. Sometimes we can preserve a piece of code behavior by getting rid of stuff, because it turns out that that code was not actually participating in the overall behavior. So the overall philosophy that people often ascribe to this is that this approach to refactoring it follows the idea of uh, Kaizen, um, uh, continuous improvement. We often talk about continuous improvement of the process of the team, of the, of the organization, but it also applies to the product and the code. The idea that we should be doing it a little bit often, we're always doing things and it's a gradual transformation. So let's have a look at a couple of these ideas in play. Um, so I run a, a page on um, uh, Facebook called Word Friday. Um, I just put language and word related stuff up there, including on some Fridays, um, I will put up a, a definition of, of an unusual word or phrase. Um, and what I put up a few years ago was biquinary coded decimal. This is a great phrase. You may be familiar with hexadecimal, decimal, and binary. Biquinary? Two, five, by five. Ah, a system of representing numbers based on counting in fives. And we can kind of see where that came from. Here's a one five, here's another five. Um, and you need an extra indicator to show whether it's in the first five or the second five. Um, you can find this on many classic abacus systems, not the abacus systems we give to our kids, but like abacus systems that we still find used in some markets in, the, in, in Asia and the Middle East um, and throughout Africa. This is a kind of very kind of classic design. You can see it's five beads plus two beads, one for the high register, one for the low register. Um, it was actually used in old computers before they figured out, you know, what, why are we trying to fake up the decimal system? Let's just use binary. Uh, we see um, uh, uh, kind of this is the classic um, uh, Colossus uh, uh, machine. Um, and so the other thing that we see is the Roman numeral system. This is a system based on biquinary. And the biquinary idea that is visible, uh, if let's, um, let's just try um, a simple um, conversion. So this is a very common um, uh, a very common uh, coding carter. And we can actually see here that if I try and write it at a reasonable font size in this style, it's not going to work very well. And what I've got is a very, very procedural, very imperative approach to doing this. Okay, we've got an accumulator variable, which is the result, and then we've got our input, and then we kind of modify both. Um, we chip away at it, and this is, um, we're trying to break the number down. If we put it in the right font, we end up with this. This is kind of fairly classic copy and paste, um, repetitive uh, uh, enterprise style coding. Um, I, I would consider this to not be a very good solution. Um, it's a very, even though it's procedural doesn't mean that something is bad, but in this particular case, this is relentlessly procedural. It's not a very well thought out uh, approach. Um, we can see a lot of recurrence and duplication in it. Now, what I find ironic is that, you know, I, I is to describe this as not a very good solution, although it's a natural solution if you're first trying to solve the problem bit by bit or bite by bite. But I've got a copy of uh, Pascal um, uh, uh, book um, by Nicholas Firth. And what I find interesting, Pascal used to be held up as this language that is good to teach and it teaches people good habits. 
And I was looking through it a couple of years ago and I stumbled across a page and I thought, wait a minute, this looks familiar. It's exactly the solution I said is not a good solution. So yeah, it kind of confirms my suspicion that the idea that Pascal teaches you good habits, I think was something that people wanted to be true, but wasn't. Um, this is a terrible solution and teaching people that this is a, an appropriate solution is not helpful. It does also highlight limitations in the Pascal language. Um, let's go back to this code. What we're gonna do is we're gonna change it. And how are we gonna do that? Small changes, not big changes, okay? If you make a mistake, it's easy to find a bug. Now, this is Python. I'm going to have some tests. You don't need a testing framework in order to do tests. It's a little bit like um, refactoring. You don't need automated refactorings in order to do refactoring. Um, what a testing framework does is it doesn't change whether or not you can do tests. It makes testing easier. That's the difference. But in this case, I can put together a number of properties and examples and group them. And just using the built-in language assertion, I can get reasonable failure results as well. Um, so it, this, this, you know, this, this works quite nicely. And I can take this code, and the way that most people will try and refactor this, it's not the rename, the names, the names are good. The way that people do is they'll say, well, right, what is repetitive? People are sometimes sensitive to the dry principle, don't repeat yourself. And they go, oh, okay, wait a minute. So I can see that this piece of code looks a lot like this piece of code, looks a lot like this piece of code. There's, and then we've got one piece of code left over at the end. What we're seeing is that there's a grouping of code, let's enlarge that, that is basically, while the number that we've got left is greater than or equal to 10 something and nine something. So for example, uh, it could be 1,900, 1, 500, 400. Okay, these are the kind of steps, or it could be um, uh, 100, 90, 50, 40, or it can be 10, 9, 5, 4. In other words, we've got these kind of step downs. It looks like this is the unit that we want to refactor. And when I see people doing this problem, sometimes they do refactor at this level. I find that when people extract method, they normally extract method too soon. They extract before they've understood. They see the first thing, rather than saying, wait a minute, I wonder if there's a few adjustments that we can make. And the adjustments that I'm going to make here is... I'm going to recognize that we've got while, if, 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 while, if, if, if. Now, what is an if statement? An if statement is a while that is executed zero or one times. It's a limiting case of that. And it turns out because of the nature of the data, if I change this to while, it pass, still passes all the tests. So now, if you look at this, you realize, wait a minute, it's, it's not a repeating structure of while, if, if, if. It's a repeating structure of while. Oh, the control flow is actually very boring. This is not a control flow problem. People often approach it as a control flow problem. In fact, this is not just the Rome, this is not about Roman numerals. This is about code that people write in production. It turns out that many people approach things as a control flow problem. This isn't a control flow problem. But also this refactoring doesn't is not really widely supported. So here's the refactoring. I've basically converted this into a table. It's a data-driven problem. Show me the data. The control flow is actually really rather boring. We just have a driver for that. And this is not a new observation. We can find this in the kind of classic, the mythical man month. Fred Brooks said, representation is the essence of programming. He says, sometimes the strategic breakthrough will be a new algorithm. But much more often, the strategic breakthrough will come from redoing the representation of the data or tables. This is where the heart of the program lies. It's like, ah, that's a really good way of looking at it. So what we see is that in many cases, we're trying to find the right abstraction. And to remind us, abstraction is not, a, it's not about being vague. It's about finding a level at which you can be precise. And quite literally, abstraction is to remove things. So it, let's consider a very simple example here. I've got this in Java. I've got a, a list of words. And what I need to do is I want to sort these into um, a, an ascending list of unique words. So. The way I might do it is to sort it, and then I need to eliminate all the adjacent duplicates. So I have only unique things. Now, the problem is that Java doesn't have a very well balanced, uh, very comprehensive algorithms library. Um, so yeah, you've got sort, but you don't have anything to do with adjacent duplicates. That's not handled in the uh, course stuff. So we have to go and write this ourselves. As you can see, this shifts the level of abstraction hugely. We suddenly decide, decide we're doing a lot of mechanics. We're doing loop management. Um, and that's a real shift. So we're better off if we were to extract method, remove adjacent duplicates. Ah, that works. It's imperative, like this. Uh, the nature of this problem. Alternatively, I can refactor into something that's quite different. I can use a different representation. Now notice 
Here I'm using the Java streams approach and this transforms it. And it's like, oh, okay, that's kind of neat. So now what I've got is, uh, and it's kind of interesting that the, the algorithms that are provided in the streams library are not the same as the algorithms that are provided in the collections uh, class. There's kind of like a bit of a mismatch there that should probably, hopefully somebody's gonna fix in future so that there's consistency between the two different paradigms. And many, many Java developers will be satisfied with this. But you'll notice it's a bit different to the previous structure, although you can get refactorings that will change, will extract streams. But the refactorings that's missing is the understanding of what is the problem. This is a much better understanding of the problem. A tree set. A tree set is an automatically ordered unique set of things. You can convert that into a list very easily. In other words, it's a property of the data structure. It's not a property of doing things to the code. Although some people like to think of this as being functional, this is much more functional in the sense that we have just created something and there is no flow of any kind whatsoever. And yet this still satisfies our solution. This is a discontinuous thing. There's this other thing to go with Kaizen, Kaikaku, which is a discontinuity, a sudden radical shift. And we can see this in other places as well. So in 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know, Burke Hafnagel talks about this example in this lovely piece, put the mouse down and step away from the keyboard. In other words, you know, <laughs> if you're having a problem, you, you might not be able to continue solving it. If you have a problem and you've been trying to solve it in a particular way and you're stuck, then putting more time and effort into that particular way is not going to help you. You need to step back, let your mind relax, okay? Let the associative part of your mind, the connection-oriented rather than the linear work-oriented part, take, take over, do something, do something else. And he highlights this thing where we're trying to transform, trying to extract data from a string, which is formatted as a 12 hour time. And we can actually see that if we look at the dot, 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 there's a lot of code here. This is relentlessly procedural, highly imperative, relentlessly procedural, not a very good solution. If you take a step back and you think about it, it's a regular expression problem. Oh, looks completely different. You don't get a, there's no automated refactoring to take you from that to that. The important point here, this is you. The point here is that refactoring is not about the tools that you, or rather it is about the tools you have. This is the most important tool. This has to understand what are alternative ways of expressing this. And you have to know what those are. If you've never seen regular expressions or you've never seen anybody use a table-driven technique, then you're working with a limited paradigm vocabulary. Um, so first of all, you need to be aware of different solution styles, but you also need to understand that you can get, you can bridge to those. And some of those, but not all of those, will be helped by automation. And of course, if we're talking about refactorings and different solutions, talk about FizzBuzz, um, FizzBuzz, the counting game, but also the coding carter. Um, uh, one, two, three, except not three, you replace three. Everything divisible by three has a fizz. One, two, fizz, four, buzz. Everything divisible by five becomes buzz. Uh, but when we get to 15, anything divisible by three and five is FizzBuzz. Okay? So, and that should define our sequence. It's not the hardest programming problem in the world, but it's used as an interview question. And, um, you know, we can again write a number of tests for this. I'll do this one again in Python. Normally FizzBuzz is evaluated from one to a hundred. So let's do that. And there are a number of truths I can state about it. I'll state these truths in English first. Every result is FizzBuzz, FizzBuzz or a decimal string. Every decimal result corresponds to its ordinal position. Every third result contains fizz. Every fifth result contains buzz. Um, every 15th result is fizz buzz. The ordinal position of every fizz result is divisible by three. The, or, yeah, the ordinal position of every buzz result is divisible by five. And the ordinal um, uh, position of every fizz buzz result is divisible by 15. In other words, these are eight properties. So if you're doing property-based testing, that's what we're doing here, uh, but in a very constrained uh, context. Um, and I chose Python for this particular example because yeah, Python doesn't have much expansion on the English. It's quite easy. Now, how can I implement it? Well, I can be very imperative about it. People seem to like this imperative. I've noticed these days people tend to, although people keep talking functional programming, I'm noticing a lot of code is becoming more imperative and procedural. People are using ifs without, uh, they're, they're, they're using jumpy control flow, ifs without else's, things like that. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, that's that, uh, it's kind of an old, but nonetheless, that, that's fine. It works. Um, this is a more structured, and more functional control flow. In other words, um, every result, every path um, is continuous and ends in a value that is returned. Um, but both of these are equivalent. Um, 
as is this, which is a table-driven approach that uses no ifs and it uses no logical branching. I'm not going to say this is a better approach. I think it's a fun approach. That's the joy of fizz buzz. You can play around with things. It's fun. That's, that's the point. But the point here is that there is no direct transformation from this to this. You can probably get to this very easily through a series of refactorings, although most refactoring tools do not say, you know what, make my code structure programming instead of um, this kind of like jumpy uh, kind of style, uh, you know, or more imperative style. Um, but you can see how to transform it. This one, yeah, not so much. So I'm going to close with um, an observation. Um, let's talk about singleton pattern or its misuse. Um, the reminder as a rule for life, um, nothing is more dangerous than an idea when you have only one idea. Um, but we also find the way that many people approach object orientation. I find a lot of people are not very familiar with object-oriented uh, programming these days, I, although they're using languages that support object-oriented programming. I find people making, uh, you know, in, this, in C-sharp, they make all their properties, uh, all their data is public. Um, yeah, they can call it properties, but it's still public. You can get it and you can set it. Um, you find people uh, doing this in a number of languages. You know, in Java, I also find people returning whole collections as part of their API, in other words, basically exposing the internal representation stuff rather than encapsulating it. Sure, the field that holds the collection is private, but they just give the collection away anyway. So we end up with this really flat design. Um, I've also seen people use a term recently, uh, in recent years, they say, I'm using a service-based design, which basically means I'm writing procedural code. In other words, they don't, their objects don't have any responsibility. They're just DTOs and you have all the business logic instead of your business logic is expressed through objects. So there's a big misunderstanding people have. They think, oh, your business logic should be in one place. Yeah, it's called the code base. That's where your business logic is. It's expressed through your objects. You don't put it in one big fat controller. So I find a lot of people don't really know object orientation um, as well as we would hope given that they're using object oriented languages. But nonetheless, people get into this stuff and then they pick up a few other odd habits. Uh, one of which is putting singletons in places. The other is injecting all the behavior that they can. Let's try and discover what we mean when we're actually trying to do um, programming. So let's talk about time. Um, I'm going to pick a clock example. So people often think, oh, a clock, that's a good example of a singleton because you only have one time. Now, where I am in my office, I can see the time in four different places. I've got one on the screen, I've got one on my phone, I've got one on my watch, and I've got one on the clock on the wall. Four different times, actually, they are slightly different by about one minute. So I guess that means my office is one light minute across. I have multiple sources of time. Actually, computers have multiple sources of time as well. There isn't the idea of one time. There's one that's picked by the system API, but actually, if you look carefully, you will find there are multiple clocks in your system. But if you're connected to a network, you also have the network clock. So there are always at least two. So first of all, I wouldn't say it's really a singleton. I might have a preferred choice, but I don't actually have a unique one. Um, in usage, this kind of violates the law of Demeter. You can always spot singletons because there's something dot something dot something. And that's not because it's a fluent API. It's because you're digging into an object structure. You're digging through assumptions. The first assumption is there is only one. Okay, it's the Highlander pattern. There is only one and it's an object. And the next assumption is, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a value that we can get. The first thing to do is decouple. This is like, why have we got this global point of coupling all through our code? Now there are perhaps pragmatic cases where this may make sense, but that's not where we should start. We have a piece of code that is time dependent. Show me the dependency. Don't hide the dependency. Show me the dependency. Now, you might want to call this injecting dependencies. I'm going to use slightly older 20th century terminology. We call this passing arguments. So if something depends on something else, um, if it depends on a value, so for example, um, if I am doing if I'm adding two numbers together and I've written a function for that, not much point, um, I pass in, I inject a, I inject the two values. No, you don't inject, you pass them in and it adds them. I, my example code is uh, dependent on the time. Right, we pass in a clock because that is its dependency or that is the value on which it, uh, that it uses. So clock dot now. So that means that our class kind of, if we look at it, um, we can actually factor it out that the singletonness is invisible. But the other thing is, I'm doing this in C-sharp, is that this isn't a property. A property is, um, this is really a function. Uh, a time is a resource. Um, don't confuse people by pretending it's actually um, a, a, a property that can be set or is modified in a way that is deterministic and controllable by you. It, it, it's, a, it's a misrepresentation of what's going on. It, it's, it's transformation. 
Now, is it still a singleton? Actually, it could be, but we're going to hide that. We're going to make it a clock. Um, we can put singletonness further down the hierarchy. Um, the point is, if it, we do decide on singleton, that's a decision that is hidden from the client. That should not depend on it. Um, we can also change it to be iClock if we want to follow the .NET naming conventions. However, many people end up only using this to avoid name collisions. That's not really why you're supposed to do this stuff. Um, be specific. You know, it's a local clock as opposed to something else. And if you want to use the other stuff, then resort to that. However, if we're really careful, we can notice that whatever we're doing, we can actually get away from the name debate. There's only one member function here. There's only one method. There's only one operation. Why do we need a whole interface for this? It turns out that many of the, because people say, oh yeah, now I can mock this and I can do, sure. But actually life is a lot easier. It's just a function. That's all it is. And maybe it belongs to another object, but you don't need to have a whole new named interface and box all kinds of stuff up. You can just pass through a function object. That's fine, like a Lambda. Or it could be associated with a real clock. The point here is the example is encapsulated from that decision as well. It's isolated from it. But if we really think about it, in most cases, not necessarily all cases, but in most cases, we are time dependent. Show the time dependency. Don't give, don't give me a provider. This is a lot of code where people put mocks in. They don't pass the value that's needed through. They pass a thing that will give you the value. Just pass the value that people want. This is about 90% of the cases. Okay, that's a number I just made up, but I know it's not 100%, but I also know it's very, very common. You just need to pass the value through. Don't pass a thing that gets you the XML, pass the XML, yeah? Don't pass a thing that gets you the thing that gets you the thing that gets you the thing. Pass the thing that people want. In other words, turn this into a much more value-based approach, okay? This is much more direct, it's much simpler. If you mean to do that, if that's what it needs is the time of day, then pass the time of day. To quote the wisdom of Morpheus, stop trying to hit me and hit me, be much more direct. We've ended up with a lot of convolution in our code. So the overall lesson here is for refactoring. Refactoring is not just a bunch of clicks to just to rename and extract a method. It's not even about the automation. It is that refactoring is a process of design. And to in order to design effectively, we obviously have to be um, exposed to a lot of design ideas where we can take code, but we also have to believe that it is possible to get from wherever we are to that piece of code. That's how we bake, make big systems. Complex systems would evolve from simple systems much more rapidly if there are stable intermediate forms than if there are not. An intermediate form that still works, that's the whole point of refactoring. We can go from a piece of code that we're not happy with without breaking everything to a piece of code that we are very happy with while still working at every single stage. And refactoring is that, but it is part of a larger story of design. It is not simply a bunch of clicks and it is not something you need to do in an emergency sprint. Of course, those, those may be things that are true and necessary at particular points in time, but that should not be our default way of thinking about it. So thank you very much. Um, I've overrun by a couple of minutes there, but I hope that was be that was useful um, and maybe kind of provoked a couple of thoughts within you. Um, perhaps we have um, time for questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, please show your love in the Slack, um, in the in the chat. Um, so please you know, clap emojis and stuff. But in the meantime, we do have a couple of questions um, yeah. here. So the first one that I would like to kind of put on stage is from Dragoslav. Um, he says, "How would you convince a team members that code needs refactoring when it's obvious it's full of smells? Long method, long class, no object mm -hmm. orientation, bad, no naming, these kind of stuff." How would you convince the team members to, to refactor? There is no one easy solution to this. If I knew it, I would tell you. Um, so you've got to approach it, because I don't know the team. Um, you've got to approach it. Right, here's a bunch of people. Um, what do they know? What are they moved by? And how do we work? Uh, so perhaps if, you are, if you're doing anything like pairing, that's obviously a lot easier, because you, pairing and mobbing allow you to um, socialize the code and show by example. In fact, I'm going to say for most of the things, I think leading by example is the way to go, but it's a lot easier if you're actually doing it in the moment there. But similarly, code reviews are a helpful way. And by, <clears throat> by this, I do want to, I want to move away from the idea of the code review that people uh, now think. I mean code reviews when people are actually reviewing the code, not yeah. kind of like, hey, it's a pull request and, you know, it looks good to me. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, people, I've, I've heard people calling that code review. No, that's not, when we talk about code review historically, we mean where people are together, 
okay, mm-hmm. even in a Zoom call, where people are together. In other words, it's, a, it's, um, it's, an informa- it's not a correctness exercise. We're not going through trying to correct the code. What we're trying to do is uh, uh, acquire knowledge about the code. Correct. What are the intentions? What is it we're trying to say? What do we know? What do we not know? All of that. And it's an educational exercise for everybody. In other words, and it's an opportunity. You know, it's, it's not about judgment and correction. But it also is that idea of spreading knowledge. That's one of the key ideas. So one of the pieces I didn't include, but in the original 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know, is a piece by Matthias Carlson uh, on code reviews, where he really talks about the social aspect. Being mm-hmm. important. It's about knowledge sharing. You know, it's, it's, it's not about the correctness thing. Of course, that's part of it, but we've got a lot of other things that also help us with that. So it's, a, it's the knowledge. So how do we convince people? Well, first of all, people have to know because not everybody arrives, you know, arrives with the same knowledge at the same time. Um, uh, that everybody has a different education and a different background and a different set of experiences, but also a different set of beliefs. You have to kind of believe that this is going to be a good idea. So. To see somebody go, oh yeah, this is a good idea, and here is how to. It's one thing to say we need to make it better, but unless people see what better looks like or can look like. So in other words, leading by example, doing it in your own code, um, and and then the opportunity to show other people. That's the other point about a code review is, is, hey, look, I took this before and after. Um, so mostly it is, if you like, I, I guess I'm talking here about leadership. Um, it is by, it's that idea of example. Telling people to do something doesn't necessarily help um, um, because they don't necessarily know what is good. They don't necessarily feel it. They don't know, and they haven't been shown how easy it is. So sometimes right. this is also group education sessions or mentoring. So it's very much about the educational structures, but sometimes you can move people in another direction as well. Sometimes the right metrics can make things look a little more, of course, you know, we, we live in an age of metrics now, and of course, metrics can be misapplied. Yeah. But when I say we live in an age of metrics, hey, guess what? We're in a pandemic. We're get, people have been bombarded with numbers they never even knew were things that you could measure over the last year or so. Um, and that, that helps us say, oh, you know, let's not go there, or, oh, the situation's getting better, or the situation's getting worse. Vaccines are having a great effect. We can see this. The point there is sometimes we need the numbers to move us. And static analysis of code can also be something, if we have that on our dashboard, the right indicators can help move people go, oh, they understand what it feels like. So in other words, sometimes it, it, it's a bit about this, and sometimes it's a bit about that, moving them uh, there. But yeah. That example, show people, show them either the way of doing it or show them there is a problem by finding the right indicators. Then they are much more likely to go with you. I like that. I like that. And I think it's totally true. I mean, that providing that context of what what is right and, you know, you know, because you have that experience, right? And just saying, like, this is right, it's not enough, right? You have to provide the it's context. Enough, no. it's, it's that social interaction. That's where people grow and learn, right? And this is where then we get better code at the end. Um, yes. And actually, there wasn't a question, but there was an interesting back and forth in the chat around, you know, what happens, you know, when a refactoring takes weeks, right? So when it becomes a refactor project versus like a rebuild project, right? Because sometimes it's, okay. we, we kind of like, so do you have any guidance for that? Yeah. Okay, no, that's a really, that's a really good one. I didn't have time to talk about that, so I'm really glad people brought that up. Okay, so some of this is to do with our vocabulary, um, as in um, we, we sometimes need more words. And I, so I, I clarified some of what I meant by refactoring, but there's a few other things here. Sometimes we need rewriting, and sometimes we need re-engineering. Now, when we st- start realizing that there's a bunch of different approaches, so refactoring is very much a gradual uh, approach with occasional blips. And I kind of show these kaikaku blips every now and then. So, oh, wait a minute, this is the wrong approach, and then a change that's more radical. But when we talk, it's talking about scale, that's where we move from the simple idea that I was talking about, that a refactoring is very much, hey, this is part of my daily work. This is part of software development. When we start saying, you know, this could take weeks, um, or we need more time commitment to this, we need more people involved, then at that point you're raising the significance of change to a point that it appears on the radar, and yeah, we need to talk about it as a plan, and perhaps we do need to continue the radar metaphor, flight clearance to do it, Mm -hmm. because this is a big thing. But at that point, we're transitioning. It's no longer really just a refactoring. Although it may involve refactorings, we should probably be using a different term, re-engineering. And that term is a term that's been around a while as well. The idea is re-engineering is its own project. It's, Mm -hmm. it's It's got a bigger ambition. It has its own indicators of progress. So sometimes we can say, 
oh, I can imagine refactoring this in this general direction. Maybe we put it on a whiteboard um, uh, or put it in a shared workspace online and say, let's head in this direction. Next time you're in this piece of code, just move it more in this direction. So you can sort of say, we are here, we want to be here. And each time somebody goes to the code, we move it gently in that direction. And that's very much that idea of small changes gradually over time, never, never breaking anything. But sometimes we need something bigger, and that is much more of a project in its own right. And so therefore, big refactoring doesn't really cover it, although people use that term, big refactoring. It's much more of a re-engineering. We, we need to rethink our approach and say, yeah. right, what is our approach here? Are we actually going to rebuild this side by side? Is this a rewrite? Is there code that we can... Uh, so re-engineering is, is a mix of reuse, rewrite, refactor. Okay, it's, it's a mix of many little processes. Mm -hmm. um, and you may say, oh, yeah, this part, you know, maybe I've got a big subsystem, and I say, this part's just fine. This part could do with a bit of love, but actually, apart from that, it's fine. This part, no, it's just not in the, even in the right place. But we have tests for the integration tests, so what we can do is we can kind of kill that and rebuild something. But we may also want something different from it. Sometimes we're dealing with code that no longer serves the purpose it was originally intended for. And at that point, we're really, you know, it's just like, actually, we're not trying to refactor it so it does the same thing. We're actually trying to remove some of its functionality and add a completely different idea. We're really mm -hmm. changing its architecture. So we're talking at a different level of significance there. So in that case, I wouldn't say it's a refactoring anymore, but I would say that refactorings are part of it. Cool. Perfect. I like that. Um, we have another question around, should we refactor existing code by opening a brand new technical issue, or should we refactor existing code while writing new code for a user story in an Agile team? How do you decide this? Oh, I think there's many, <laughs> I don't think there's any wrong answers here, but I think you need more than one answer, uh -huh. um, because I think there are different situations. So, for example, there is this idea, um, if I'm in a piece of code, and I'm changing it because I'm gonna add functionality, okay? In other words, that's my motivation for being here. Um, I'm changing it because there's, I'm changing this code to add a feature. Okay, so I'm here, while I'm here. Now, we've all done this in our own homes, in our own rooms. It's just like, yeah, well, I need to move this, but while I'm here, I'll just tidy this bit up here as well, yeah? Or I'll just move this out of the way or something like that. We, we've all done that. That's, so in other words, that's part of your natural workflow. So just think of refactoring as part of your natural workflow in those cases. Hey, I'm here, let's just flow, and that's fine. In other cases, you may say, um, uh, when people say, should we open an issue for this? Normally you're trying to solve a problem that that code is indicating. So be, first of all, you need a proper motivation. Um, if you look at books like um, Adam Tornhill's Your Code as a Crime Scene, mm -hmm. there's a lot of good uh, uh, thinking in that um, in terms of code analytics. What you may say is like, you know, this code is a real problem area. Every time we touch it, you know, we lose time, we introduce bugs. Or you may say this is a defect hotspot, mm -hmm. okay? Now I have a motivation that is not simply about I'm trying to add a bit of functionality today or tomorrow, or I'm just refactoring because I think the code would be nicer. You know, if you've got a piece of ugly code and it's got no, and it doesn't really show up on your radar, or it's not shown to be a problem, then you're gonna find, don't, there's not a strong case for changing it. Yeah. But if you've got a piece of code that's relatively frequently changed, but also a known source of problems. Now, here's where you talk about an issue, because it is an issue. Yeah. We've actually got evidence that is separate. We can say, look, we can build a case for it. This should be fixed. We can actually say it is broken in that sense. So normally try and keep issues for things that need fixing. And I would say, yeah, look, this is a hotspot for all kinds of problems. Everybody complains about it. We always end up with problems here. It always takes longer to work. It deserves a special piece of work, let's call that, a, let's, let's raise an issue. And therefore we, we're identifying that. So both approaches, you're in the flow of your work, hey, opportunity tells me that this is better. I've got this big growing, sw big R switch statement that keeps growing ev bigger every single change. And guess what I'm gonna do? Add another case. No, now is an opportunity to you know, um, uh, stop digging the hole any deeper yeah. and say, yeah, I'm in, the, I'm in the code. Here I am. This is, this is where I should be. I'm not going to go around just randomly picking switch statements, but because I'm here to add features, this is perfect. And then other cases which are known problem areas. So that kind of, so both approaches are, uh, they have their day. Yeah, it's kind of like clear as you go, and then yes. when you get the smells, you kind of like, let's document that smell because maybe that's where like, the potential problem yeah. is, so that's a separate yeah. issue. The, 
the, the kitchen is actually a mess in this. We always have a problem in this part of the kitchen. Okay, we're going to need to move a few things around. And that's just a, that's a, that occurs to us every day, but yeah. it's a bigger piece of work and it's not just putting the dishes away or cleaning things. There's a little bit more there, but it's not, let's redesign the whole kitchen and tear <laughs> it out, which is the previous question. Correct. Cool. Um, we have another question. Um, if you encountered untested legacy code, are there any refactorings that you would be ready to apply immediately? Or would you just first increase the test coverage to some level? And to what level? Okay, right. So the, the, so the, the, uh, the TLDR, um, it depends. Because it does depend. It depends a bit on language and it depends on what, uh, what test you're, uh, the nature of the test, the nature of the system. So when I say it depends on language, if I'm working in a language like Python, um, highly dynamic language, uh, and that means I can't rely on the type system, okay? If I'm working, uh, let's say I'm working um, in uh, C, that has a static type system. It's a little bit weak in its checking, but it has a static type system. So therefore we can rely on it. There are certain kinds of refactorings I can do that rely on the compiler. So anything that is statically, you know, Java, static, uh, C sharp, static, predominantly in both of those languages. There's a bunch of changes you can do that if you get them wrong, the compiler will call you out. Mm -hmm. You can extract interface without having to automate the extract interface. Because if you get it wrong, guess what? The compiler's gonna say, yeah, you're calling a method that doesn't exist or it's completely wrong. So there are some refactorings I could do there that, le um, to use the term from Michael Feathers, lean on the compiler. But in Python, I can't. On the other hand, in Python, there's a whole load of dynamic stuff I can do. It's just like, oh, I can introduce certain tests that I wouldn't otherwise be able to because of the dynamic nature of the language, because I don't have to extract an interface. I can pass a thing in that's different as long as it supports the same methods. So in other words, feel the bumps, feel what, what is the kind of language, what is it really good at on its own? So what does the language give me? A dynamic language gives you much better substitutability and flexibility, which also allows you to get in there and introduce kinds of tests you wouldn't necessarily be able to do um, in uh, statically um, static-based language um, without doing more refactoring. Uh, the other thing is where you have automated refactorings that are reliable. Again, I refer to C-sharp and uh, Java because there's a lot more reliability um, in those refactorings because they are type-based. Um, then, so in other words, what have I got? What have we, ha you know, gather your resources together. What is available to you as, as good refactorings? So choose those, uh, first of all, don't, you know, if you've got a gnarly piece of logic, but you don't have any good logic-based refactorings available to you, don't touch it, okay? Do, do the ones that are easy. Then the question of tests, how much is good coverage? Well, I don't know. If you've got, <laughs> if you've got no tests, then some tests will help you. You need a reality check. Um, but there is also the idea of what test are we are we at? Do we have some unit tests over here, but not over here? Or do we have patchy unit tests everywhere? Or do we have integration oriented tests? So in other words, for each one of these situations, I'd probably recommend a slightly different approach. If you've got a good suite of integration tests, much as I'd like to say, yeah, right, lots of unit tests now, go with the flow, go with what you've already got there. Um, people, it's, it's more familiar and you've probably got more code you can copy and paste. Am I allowed to say that? Copy and paste? Yeah, I'm going to say it. Um, but you've got more you've got as a starting point. So go with, in other words, I think the answer to the, the general answer to the question is, what is available to me that makes my life easier? And go with that. Rather than perhaps a blog post, which is very well informed about one person's specific context, yeah. that may not match your context. They're starting from a different position. Um, maybe you can get to that position, or maybe that's not a position you will ever go through. Um, but yeah, don't break things just because this blog said so or that book said so. It's kind of like, where am I? Uh, like refactoring being gradual process. Where am I? And I want to get here. What's the point here and here and here? Is testing the right way to go as my first step or is there something else I can do? What kind of testing? At each stage, what is the easiest next thing? Cool, love that answer as well. And um, we're wrapping up here.